every once in a while, I find myself in a situation where I feel completely uh, uncomfortable and I have very little way of fixing that. So for instance, uh, maybe a couple times a year, I might find myself in a foreign country and I don't speak the language and I'm not even sure really what the plan is and all that makes me really uncomfortable. Right? All that makes me super uncomfortable. I'm used to knowing uh, the plan and being in charge and being in control and having agency. And then when I don't know what's going on, I feel really uncomfortable. You might call it a wilderness. And then I can't even use the words that I typically use to make my way through the world because I can't speak the language. So I'm really a fish out of water. And then someone says, hey, you know, let's, let's go grab dinner. And I think, I know how to eat. I may not speak the language. I may not know the plan. I know how to eat. And so we get a chance to gather around a table and just that moment of table fellowship, that moment of having a meal together provides for me such an olive branch of peace and of grace in the moment. It points me to the fact that it's going to be okay. I might be uncomfortable. I might not have all the answers. My way of life may have stopped working for me, but it's going to be okay. And so as we continue in our series talking about how God provides for us in the wildernesses of our lives. Today we're going to see that hospitality is a tangible sign of God's grace in the wilderness. That sometimes all we need is just a glimpse, a taste, that there is something better, that there's life beyond the wilderness we find ourselves in, that another way of life is possible. If you'd grab a Bible and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 25, in your pew Bibles, it's page 417. Would love for you to have a Bible in front of you as we go through this text. It's a long story. It might be somewhat of an unfamiliar story for many of us. Uh, It is a wilderness story. uh, It happens actually in the wilderness. And and, uh, and so I'm going to be reading some of the passages, and then we're going to be summarizing some of it as we go. Because, again, it's it's a quite long story, but it's really powerful and really cool. And we find that we have multiple characters in this story who are in the wilderness. Now, 1 Samuel is an Old Testament book that describes how God creates a kingdom of people, uh, who we know as the Israelites, who, he creates a kingdom of people to be his people in the world. He does that through using broken, flawed humans in the midst of their weaknesses, not their strength. And we see one of those stories here today. And so pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 2. It says, A certain man in Maon, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a 1,000 goats and 3,000 sheep, which sounds like a lot, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal. Pause there. Okay. Character number one, Nabal. We're told all about his wealth, his influence, and his status before we're even told his name. And that should clue us in that something's happening. Pick back up in the next uh, few words. It says, his name was Nabal and his wife's Name was Abigail. We're given Abigail's name right away, second player in the story. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. So we see immediately they're being set up that, that Abigail is the foil to whatever Nabal is going to do in the story. Character one, character two. Pick up verse four. While David was in the wilderness, character three, David, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So pause right there. So, so David is by far the most famous character in the story, the most famous character in the Old Testament of the Bible. Uh, David will go on to be the king of Israel. He is not the king yet, nor is he the little shepherd boy that threw stones at Goliath. He's somewhere in between those two, where years earlier, a, shepherd, uh, a prophet of God had come and said, you are anointed. You are the next king of Israel. But the problem was there was already a king of Israel, and that king did not like the fact that this young David had been anointed as the next king of Israel. So David was kind of like in the wilderness because he was in exile. He was on the run for his life with a a band of people that were loyal to him as he awaited to see how God would make him king. You might say he was leading a rebellion out in the wilderness, waiting for the moment in which God would lead him to become king of Israel. But he was not king yet. Saul was still the king, and Saul didn't like David being out here in the wilderness. So you can imagine how David is feeling about his life out here in exile. And they've been in exile, and he says, uh, this is where, pick it back up in verse 5. So he, David, sent ten young men, ten of his men, and said to them, go up to Nabal, 
at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. So he's giving him greetings of flattering and blessing. Uh, Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. So apparently Nabal's shepherds had been around David and his men out in the wilderness, and David said, we didn't mistreat them. We didn't attack them, and and sheep and shepherds were often harassed by both uh, uh, attackers and by the elements and by animals. And he said, "We we didn't attack them. We were good to them. And the whole time they were with us, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants, and they will tell you. Therefore, 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 since I've been good to you, therefore, you know how this works, therefore, be favorable towards my men, since we come at party time. Please give your servants and your son David, so David's saying, I'm, I'm your servant, whatever you can find for them. So pause right there. Okay. So what happens is David is trying to make an alliance with Nabal, who is a rich, influential man in this part of town. He's got a lot of stuff and a lot of people and a lot of loyalty and allegiance. And David is saying, show me favor. He also, he's also saying, We've been, you know, foraging for berries in the woods for months. We'd, we'd love some of your lamb. But he's also, he's saying, make an alliance. We've been good to you. Be good to us. We'll form this little alliance. So David is gathering people following him, people being loyal to him as he's in the wilderness leading this somewhat of a rebellion. And that's what he expects. He expects because he's been good to Nabal's people that Nabal will be good in return. But we've already been told Nabal is a foolish man. His name means folly. So David sends his men. His men ask, and here's what, uh, here's what Nabal says in verse 10. Here's his response. Nabal answered David's servants, who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. There are lots of little rebels running around in the woods. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? These are fighting words. You call yourself King David? I don't know who you are. Saul is the real king. I will not ally myself with you. I will not feed your people. I owe you nothing. Here's what David says in response. His men come back and tell him, this is what Nabal has said. David said, each of you strap on your sword. A man after my own heart right there. Let's get him. I mean, how often have I found myself in a wilderness moment because someone offended me? Because someone spoke ill of me. Because someone disrespected me. And that's where David finds himself. In this wilderness moment, he feels disrespected. And he says, strap on your swords. And, the God, and God judge me if by tomorrow every single man in Nabal's household and village aren't dead. And he rushes to destroy them. And in the meantime, Abigail's heard from Nabal's servants. This is how your husband treated David in the wilderness. And Abigail knows this is gonna go poorly. So what she does is she gets together like the most lavish royal picnic you can imagine, like the best charcuterie board, and she brings it and she meets David and his men like rushing down the road to attack Nabal and his people. She meets and she lays down in the road and she says, please don't do this. Do not rush, do not attack. And using the hospitality of the meal, she begs David, don't do this. And what she says to him is really powerful. And so that we hear it uniquely, I'm actually going to invite you a little bit uncomfortable, but if you would just stand for a moment, let's stand for this reading of God's word. Because like, you know, at the end of a hockey game, when it's coming down to the wire, we all stand, right? Because we want to look, we want to get focused in, we want to make sure we're there and present. I want to make sure we're there and present for this passage. This is what Abigail says to David as he's rushing forward to slaughter Nabal and his village. Here's what, here's what she said. He says, verse 30, when the Lord, when God has fulfilled for my Lord David every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, when God makes you king, my Lord David will not have 
on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed or having avenged himself. And when the Lord your God has brought you, has brought my Lord, has brought David success, remember your servant, remember Abigail. You can have a seat. Did you see what happened there? Did you see what she did? She said, David, one day when you're king, do you really want this needless bloodshed because you rushed foolishly to slaughter these people because your pride was offended? Do you want this hanging over you for the rest of your life? So she does, calls out, she does two things. She calls out, you don't want this hanging over you. And also, you're gonna be king one day. In a moment where when David's in the wilderness, he's not king yet. He doesn't know how he's going to get there. And you've got powerful people like Nabal saying, you're just a rebel that ran away into the wilderness. And she affirms, no, that is what God has for your story. And so what we see is in the wilderness, two things happen because of hospitality. The first is hospitality can restrain our foolishness. It can keep us from rushing to do something that we're going to regret later when we're not in the wilderness. And the other thing it can do is strengthen our faith. It can remind us who we are because the wilderness can often break down our faith and our belief. It can make us be wobbly in our conviction. And so hospitality gives us an image, a glimpse. No, no, that's not the story of who you are. Here's who God says that you are. See, some of us, Some of us need to be restrained from foolishness so that we don't let the pressure or the stress of the wilderness push us to do something that we'll regret later. And if you're anything like me, like when I do that, when I I act foolishly because the pressure of the moment has caused it, it just makes it worse. Like I just end up in a worse wilderness. I just make it worse for myself. It doesn't get better by rushing to avenge myself, by rushing to make it right, by setting that person straight. Like I act foolishly in the moment and it doesn't make it better. It further cements my place in the wilderness. But some of us also need to have our faith strengthened to be reminded that we aren't defined by what we can't do in the wilderness, but we're defined by what God has done for us. And I think this is partly what, David has in mind as he writes those famous words in Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. How does God keep the wilderness from being overwhelming? He prepares a table before me. He prepares a table before you. You see, you might be surrounded by enemies. You might be at a place in your life where like all the tricks you know to make life better have stopped working for you. You might be at a place where like your emotions keep overwhelming you and threatening to push you to do something foolish in the heat of the moment. You might be in a place where your faith has been shaken. But here's the thing. In the kingdom of God, our weaknesses and our struggles and our limitations are not liabilities. The apostle Paul says that when I am weak, then I am strong. Where I am weak, that's where God desires to go to work. And the enemy, the wilderness of our lives, is no match for where God goes to work and offers us hospitality. In fact, I would say the only thing that ensures that you survive the wilderness is the hospitality of Christ. It's his hospitality that gets us through. It's his hospitality Right? It's something that's unexpected. It does not come from within us. Every day we're told stories about who we are and that we will make the, our lives better by how hard we work, by how smart we are, by our ability to do better, be better, learn more. That's not the story God tells about your life, though. He enters into your weakness and doesn't say, try harder. He says, I've got you. He offers you grace from unexpected places. And the grace in this story, it doesn't come from the would-be king. It doesn't come from the local uh, rich landowner. It comes from Abigail. Abigail enters into that separation, that space between David and Nabal. She enters into the space so that lives would be spared and destruction would not come. 
And in the same way, Jesus enters into the space between humans and God's the separation created by our sin. Jesus enters into it so that our lives would be better than the doom and destruction we would otherwise rush headlong into. He provides for us right where we need it. And Abigail offers hospitality, a meal that makes peace. And in the same way, Jesus offers us his body, sacrifices his life on the cross to make peace for our lives and our world. And that's why when we take communion, like we will in just a few minutes, when we take communion, you hear the words, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and taste and see that the Lord is indeed good. Hospitality is a sign, a tangible take and taste and see sign of God's grace in the wilderness. This is how God offers his grace to a hurting world. Not through judgment or withdrawal or hatred or antagonizing the other side, through hospitality. Once we know the hospitality of Christ for ourselves, the acceptance, the nourishment, the friendship, we can become that hospitality to others. And we offer people glimpses of the grace of Christ through meals and conversation and welcome in the midst of loneliness, through acceptance, through presence and love. Here's what Jesus says in Mark chapter nine. He says, everyone is going through a refining fire sooner or later. We all go through wilderness, but you'll be well-preserved, protected from the eternal flames. The wilderness will not get the last word. Be preservatives yourself. Preserve the peace. See, in the wilderness, we can receive hospitality and we can show hospitality because we've let Christ set a table before us. And that opens us to the way that the gospel is moving, to believe that there's something better, to believe that another way of life is possible beyond the wilderness because we get those tangible signs of hospitality from Christ and from others. Some of you are familiar with uh, the show, The Bear. And uh, in, in The Bear season two, uh, there's an episode. And so The Bear is a show about a restaurant in Chicago and, and it focuses on the life of the owner and the chefs. And uh, in season two, uh, there's, a, there's a chef named Sid and Sid is preparing meals. They're opening a new restaurant. She's working on recipes for a new meal and everything just goes wrong. Every meal she cooks tastes terrible. Nothing works out right. And she's just kind of like at her wit's end. And her boss, Carmi, who is like the main character of the show, Carmi sends Sid off to like just eat at all the restaurants she can handle for the day. And so in the episode, you follow Sid as she goes to like a bakery and has all these like different dishes and and drinks. And then she goes to like a Michelin star restaurant. She goes to a diner and has uh, has like an ice cream sundae. And, you know, honestly, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it a little bit. It's like the perfect day. When the chef could no longer fix food, she let others cook for her. When her ability ran out, she let others provide a meal. When we get to the end of our rope, let's let Christ feed us. When all the ways that we know to fix our lives run out, let's let Christ set a table before us. Every time and every moment you find yourself in the wilderness, Let Jesus feed you. Amen. I'm going to invite Melissa to come up and lead us in the words of institution as we prepare to take communion together. This communion table is a table of hospitality. It's a table of God's hospitality toward us not just while we are getting along and in good relationship, but actually Paul says that while...